Good morning. morning. Our scripture lesson comes to us this morning from the book of Psalms. We're in Psalm 66 today. Shout for joy to to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in him. He rules forever by his power. His eyes watch the nations. Let not the rebellious rise up against him. Praise our God, all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. For you, God, tested us. You refined us like silver. You brought us into prison and laid burdens on our backs. You let people ride over our heads when we went through fire and water. But you brought us to a place of abundance. I will come to your temple with burnt offerings and fulfill my vows to you. Vows my lips promised and my mouth spoke when I was in trouble. I will sacrifice fat animals to you and offering of, and an offering of rams. I will offer bulls and goats. Come and hear all you who fear God. Let me tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. His praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God surely has surely listened and has heard my prayer. Praise be to God who has not rejected my prayer or withheld his love from me. Let's pray for Pastor Mike as he comes. Lord God, you have called us to this place today and you have called Pastor Mike, Lord, indeed, to come and share these words. And we ask today, God, that your spirit would fill him today. Lord, as he is preparing to uh, go later this week to jet to a jurisdictional conference and for a little bit of summer games, God, we know that you have put much on his heart. But today, God, you have put this message at the center of his heart. And we pray that you would be with him as he preaches these words boldly and mildly and that you would give each of us here words to hear and hearts to receive. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I do also want to just take a moment and <clears throat> thank you for all your prayers for <clears throat> summer games and for me going to jurisdictional conference. And I just want to shoot this out for you for your own research. Um, I am part of what's called the Wesley Covenant Association. I'm one of the endorsers of their ministry, which is a theological position. And also, and if you want to see what that is, look up Wesley Covenant online. I encourage you to do that. You'll see a little bit about what's going on online and I think where the future of our denomination needs to turn uh, itself. So be praying for that and, and take a understanding of that. It's called Wesley Covenant. So John Wesley Covenant, you know, pretty easy stuff. And before I go right into the sermon, uh, let's just take a minute and let's acknowledge um, kind of the heartbrokenness of our world right now. Um, you know, we, we hear news stories of, of people being killed and, and, and violence um, being done by people. And, of course, we pray for law enforcement. We pray for families that have lost people. We pray for the brokenness of the world because it seems like every single day, you know, we, we hear of a different shooting that's happened. And I know that, that good ideas are great and legislation can help. And I'm your pastor. And I feel that the real solution to all this is a spiritual solution. That if people would fully and completely lean their hearts into God, then we would do as the Lord encourages us to do, which is love one another and not have to do away with others because our ideologies, our viewpoints are different. So, so I'm asking you as, as people to join with me uh, before I preach uh, the word that Keith read a few moments ago to pray for our world uh, and that hearts might be healed. And that in your grief and mourning, which I hope you are every time you see that someone was shot or, or these kind of things, uh, that you'll put yourself into God. Let's take a minute. Let's pray. Stop us from all the noise, Lord. Stop us from the swirling words of the 24-hour news cycle, as we call it. Because, Lord, when lives are lost, that's not news. That's pain. 
that's brokenness, that's despair. Lord, let us spend as much time praying for a solution as we do hearing about the problem. Let us make sure, Lord, that to the fellow men and women in this world, that on your behalf, because of your movement in our lives, we do act kindly and appropriately. Lord, let's pray for every broken heart and every broken mind in this world that they might come together as ones, that they might be made whole, that they might find other pathways than violence to solve whatever breaks and aches within them. In your name, Lord, we humbly pray because we know you want the world to be loving. And if it be your will, I'll make it so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> We are walking through the Psalms, if you're new among us today, uh, this summertime, and we're at Psalm 66, and I, I start with um, <clears throat> a little piece from a guy named John Ed Matheson, pastor of a giant church in Mobile, Alabama, giant United Methodist Church, Fraser Memorial. And uh, one Sunday morning, they were having a bad snow and ice storm in Mobile, Alabama. Now, if you've ever been to Mobile, Alabama... When it's snowing or icy, you want those people not to drive, right? When it's, I mean, State Farm Insurance wants them not to drive. Grinnell Mutual wants them not to drive. Nobody wants them driving on that kind of bad weather because they don't know how to handle it. But, and so they had canceled, they had canceled services at the church, but John Ed lived his parsonage just a couple blocks away, so he walked down to the church that particular Sunday morning thinking, well, we've got some hardy Methodists around here. Surely someone would, would come. Most of them had heard the news, but when he got there early in the morning, a few minutes before 8 o'clock, he walked up, slipping and sliding his way. There was Gladys, 85-year-old Gladys, standing outside the door. She normally entered in, though there wasn't a car in that magnificently giant parking lot. That's something I coveted. She stood there waiting to get into worship, and he, he walked up to the door and said, Gladys, what are you doing here? She said, it's Sunday morning, Pastor, I come to church. She says, Gladys, don't you know, haven't you heard on the news, our services are canceled this morning. And he said, I'll never forget what she stood back to me. Looking underneath, out from underneath her rain bonnet, she looked at me and said, Pastor, we may have canceled services, but God never cancels worship. Amen. God never cancels worship. Worship is always ongoing because here's the thing. Worship matters to God. Worship matters to God. God loves worship. It, it, worship is intimate relationship with God. It's when God and, and, and we come heart to heart, breath to breath, face to face. See, worship recognizes God's role in creation. And worship brings joy to God. So you have to understand that God is the father of the entire family of humanity. And when people come to worship him, it's, it's, it's as if all of his kids are in the same place. And if you've ever been part of a family reunion or something like that, one of the joys of that is that we're all in the same place. And when all the hearts of, of, of God's people turn to him, it brings joy to him. So when a single heart <clears throat> turns to him, God grants them reconciliation and reconciliation in the family. See, worship really matters to God. And, and, and secondly, worship really matters to people. Worship's important to us. Worship tells us that not everything is about us. It's important to know, isn't it? That, that not everything, <clears throat> pardon me, not everything is about us. We tend to think that, that we're the center of all that is going on, but, but, but we're not. And when we worship God, we realize that there's something greater and more glorious than us. We understand by, by the expressions of adoration and praise we are. We, we lift up God giving thanks that he doesn't give us what we deserve, but replaces what we deserve with his love and his mercy. So when we're at worship, we're connected intimately with God. We're connected with him in ways that... We aren't when we don't just declare that we're at worship. And worship slakes our spiritual thirst, even maybe just for a little while, because that's the one thing about Christians. We need to have repetitive worship. We don't just have worship once in your life, get you confirmed and say, OK, see you in heaven. Because we need our thirst slaked time and time again. Now, 
Those two things are true. And let me go into why we need to talk about this today. Because worship is more than just showing up. Worship is more than just showing up. Worship's a lifestyle that includes a number of things. See, worship is not songs, no matter how magnificent they are. Worship is not fantastic sermons, no matter how, how, how prolific they are in the movement of your heart. Worship is not simply reading the right scriptures or praying prayers. All those are elements in, in worship. <clears throat> but them in and of themselves... They're not worship because you can hear all those things. And, you know, frankly, I've spent many Sundays before I was a pastor. And maybe some since I've been a pastor. When all those elements were present. And yet I failed to worship. And I would, I would contend that there are people that are here in this place that have been to activities, that have been to worship services, a worship time here where the right scripture has been read. Maybe even the right one for your heart. The right prayers have been said. Uh, probably a pretty good sermon was laid out. Songs were sung. And yet, you failed to worship. Even though you were at worship. Because you truly weren't there to worship God. There, there's a lot of things we need to understand. That, that worship is not the elements of worship. Worship is the spirit of worship. And worship's not a feeling either. You know, sometimes people say, oh, when I'm at worship, I just feel, you know, you can feel the same way at a lot of different things. I was at a, a concert a few years ago, paid 85 bucks to go to it. And when the last song came out, well, all of us that love that band, I'm stopping at, standing at the top of the Bradley Center in Milwaukee, can't light, you know, matches anymore. So we all hold our cell phones up and we're all doing this, right? It was a pretty good feeling because Fleetwood Mac was playing what I like. I was connected with the person over there, and over, well, I was married to this one, so I was good. But you know, you know, we're way, swaying like this. I said, you know, that kind of a feeling you can re- replicate that in a lot of different ways. Because I thought to myself, well, in my in my spirit, I've felt this way standing in here, or camp, or some other place. So, so worship's not feeling. See, worship's a lifestyle, and, and worship's a lifestyle that that I'm going to share with you today. I think that that includes six things. The first is, is surrender of our lives. We have to specifically put distractions away. Yesterday morning, I had a funeral of, of, of one of our uh, members of our Marian community. And, and right before the funeral, the f- funeral director comes into a small room. And I'm going to lead the family in prayer. But the funeral director comes in. And he says, all right. Pulls his cell phone out. And he says, all right, everybody, take these out. Make sure you turn them off because a lot of you people have interesting ringtones. And you don't want that in the middle of your mom's funeral. I know now somebody's phone's going to ring, but um, and we're going to all be doing, you know, some the Macarena or something like that. But the fact, what he was telling us is we need to put this stuff away so we won't be distracted. And the same is true with us in worship, whether it's here or some other place. We need to specifically, we need to mentally and appropriately say, I'm going to take distractions out of my... You know, because a lot of us have spiritual ADD. Just during the time I was telling you that story, you drifted off somewhere else. Right? We have to take distractions and put them away. We have to say, I don't need to think about what I'm going to have for lunch. I don't need to be concerned that Mike might preach a couple minutes too long and make me late to my engagement at Perkins this morning. He'll make more tables. We need to put our distractions away and completely be in worship, not simply at worship. You understand the difference, right? We have to surrender our ways and our, our lives in such a way that we're in worship, not simply just present for worship. Secondly, we need to put our focus <clears throat> on God. You understand, as do I, but it's hard, that our likes and dislikes, our preferences and, and priorities are inconsequential to God. They're inconsequential to the worship of God. When we, when we put our focus entirely on God, it means that when we came here, we desired to honor God. And we put extravagance into that honoring of God. Let, let me just ask you, I know that this will be you know, rhetorical because you probably won't shout out. But it's really important for us to do a little bit of a, an analysis of our hearts when you think, what was my morning like? You know, it's still relatively early in the morning. For our high school kids, it's really early in the morning. But some of you, it's still relatively early in the morning. What... 
did you go through to get here today? How many of you woke up and said, I got to put myself together in such a way that I can completely focus on honoring God during this period of time today? I, I would think that some of us were more concerned with ancillary details of our lives, with where my hairbrush is, or why can't I find my car keys? And do I have enough time for that second cup of coffee? Do I go? But, but you see, when we put our focus, the lifestyle of worship is, did we come extravagantly prepared to honor God? Did we put everything else aside? Third, to have a lifestyle of worship, we need to move away from the center of our own attention. That's a hard one for human beings because we know ourselves pretty well, don't we? We're pretty clear about what we need, about what, what we want. But I want, to hear, I want you to hear this again because we've said it here before. Worship is not for us to get something, to be entertained, or to get therapy. Pastor Keith and I and Vicki have all met many folks who have said something like, I don't get anything out of worship. Oftentimes it's when they've left our church or gone to someone's. I just don't get anything out of it. I want it to be clear here that worship is not for us to get something. There's this new thing. It's a, it's a new thing about worship. A lot of churches are, are, are pursuing this. It's called MTD. Actually, without knowing that term, MTD, Keith and I and Vicki and a lot of you have been trying to avoid this, have been pushing back against this for years. MTD is this. It's called moralistic therapeutic deism. In a lot of churches, that's all they do. Moralistic therapeutic deism. You know, it's pretty simple to break that down. What's moralistic? Well, we just come to church and we tell people to be good. Just to go out and be good people. Just be moral. Don't, uh, don't kill anybody. Don't flip the guy off that cuts you off in traffic. Uh, be nice person. You know, let, uh, let the older people step in front of you in the buffet line. Help them if you can. Just be a good person. That's moralistic. What's therapeutic? Therapeutic means that you come to church and the people up here try to make you feel good about yourselves. As if that's the main goal. Make, you know, go feel good about yourself. Have a nice little week. Come back next week. And we'll, you know, we'll psychologically recharge you again. We'll pat you on the head and come back. And lots and lots of churches do that. They spend all their time saying, you know, do good things. And, and, and I mean, the reason we make sandwiches for kids, it's not because we want to do good things. It's because God has possessed us to do extravagant things. The, the, the reason that we hope when you leave worship that you feel better spiritually or some deep way psychologically in your soul, it's not because we've told you, hey, everything's okay, it's going to be good, but because God is moving you in such a way that you can say through it all. Through it all, I can trust in God and, and, and things will, will, will grow up. And, and, you know, deism is simply that there's a God out there, but this God, you know, creates us and kind of watches over us. He's our homeboy, you know, we get a cool tad of him and all that kind of stuff. More moralistic, therapeutic deism. You can do a Google search on it and do a lot more. But really what it is, it's a new version of that old book from the 70s. I'm okay, you're okay, and the center of the world is you. Because if you're okay, then your world's okay. Worship does not concentrate on what you get. And just so you know, it won't as long as we're the pastor here. It won't. Worship centers on giving. Worship is completely centered on, on, on giving yourself in worship. And, and when you look at the Psalms, look what they tell you to give. Uh, you know what? If we did Israel worship in here like the Psalms, you would hate it. Shout for joy, all the earth. Clap your hands. If I came in here next week and said, all right, we're changing everything in here. We'll stay traditional. But when we sing, you got to go, whoa, whoa, chap, chap, chap. You know, the, the chosen frozen among us, we would shatter. No. Not going to that kind of church. But it's not about methodology. The point is... You know, we, we sometimes will go somewhere else and worship and say, well, their worship's so much cooler. Well, it is for them. You know, since, since my, my daughter married into a different culture, it's interesting when you're in the same place at the same time. 
I'll give you an example. We were at a, a place where there was a lot, of, a lot of worship music going on one time. And my, my son-in-law's family, who's African-American, man, when the music starts going, they're like... I mean, they're dancing. Now, white folks like me, and I'm so white you can almost see through me. I get that, right? The music starts hopping for us. I mean, when we're really emotional, it's kind of like this. <laughs> right? So I don't know which one's right, which one's wrong. The methodology is not what's important. It's, it's the fact that we're moving into the worship, that, that it's not the method. The point is you've got to get all in. You got to put yourself all in, even if you're, you know, if I said, raise your hands and you got to this high, right? Maybe that's as far as we'll go, you know, but, but the point is not our emotionalism. The point is not some methodology. The point is to put ourselves all into worship, into the essential, vital, indispensable, defining heart of worship, because that's the experience of being with God and centering all of our attention on God in a lifestyle of worship. Fourthly includes personal sacrifice. Hebrews 13 says, Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice. That's, that's given ourselves. A continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to His name. We have to sacrifice our feelings. We have to sacrifice our fears to concentrate on our relationship with God. And fifth, to have a lifestyle of worship. It means moving toward God in the face of pain and loss. You, do you ever notice, uh, you know, I'm a football guy, so do you ever, when you're watching football, do you ever notice how much easier it is to praise God after scoring a touchdown? You never once seen a guy go out of bounds after dropping a pass, you know, break down and say, dear God, thank you for letting me miss that pass. Amen. Right? They praise God when they win because... It's easier for us. We don't maybe score touchdowns very many of us anymore. But it is easier to praise God when things are going well. Many, many, many people I know, some of us even in here, maybe even me from time to time, many of us move away from God when life gets tough, not towards Him. We move away from God when life gets tough. But understand your biblical examples. Notice what David does. David, when his whole life is a mudstorm, when he has this, this baby, it's, you know, it's born, you know, it's a b- bad birth because it's with Bathsheba and all that kind of stuff. But when, when that baby dies, David doesn't go forlorn, walk out into the long depth valley of, of Israel. Nah, he rips his clothes, gets himself prepared and goes and worships God. He moves towards God when things are hitting the fan, not away from God, which is the example for us. We need to say, we must be able to say, I have so much pain. I have so much sadness or I have so much embarrassment. I need to be close to you, God, not far from you. I got so much pain. I got so much sadness. I got so much embarrassment. It seems to be just pouring out. It seems to be, to me, that's all people see when they see me. And I need to be closer for, to you, Lord. Not running from you. See, worship, a real heart of worship is moving toward God. And moving towards God's people. Even in the face of pain and loss. And, and six, the lifestyle of worship includes celebrating God for who he is. And what he has done. You really need to embrace the personality of God. With no asterisks. Don't say, hey, there's a few things about God's personality I just don't like, so I don't want to attend, attend to those. And we really need to embrace the character of God. Again, with no abstracts. Don't, you know, asterisks. Don't say, well, I really love God, except for this whole deal about forgiving bad people I'm not a big fan of. No, we can't have that. We need to celebrate God for who he is and what he's done. And, and so, so the remainder of minutes I want to, I want to spend, spend on that. That begins with thanking the Lord for what he's done yesterday. We thank God for what he has done yesterday. We don't overlook <clears throat> the operations of his hand, excuse me, <clears throat> just because we didn't see it happen. We thank the Lord for yesterday. See, I'm a big fan of coffee. You probably knew that, some of you that know me. And I love Dunkin' Donuts coffee. Do you love Dunkin' Donuts coffee? 
And I said to somebody last week that's half my age, I am so excited. As a matter of fact, I ripped it out of the newsletter, posted it on Instagram. I'm so fired up about this. I said, I'm so excited that Dunkin' Donuts is coming back to Marion. And they said to me, there's never been a Dunkin' Donuts in Marion. I said, au contraire, young feller. Because back when I was in high school, there was a Dunkin' Donuts right across the street from Country Kitchen, right beside Chuck Kent State Farm Insurance. I know later it became a flower shop and a, and a tanning salon, but there was a Dunkin' Donuts there. It's coming back just, young feller, because you weren't here for it. Didn't mean it doesn't happen. Right? We need to remind ourselves that in the, in the age and the eyes of God, that history doesn't begin with us. We're the young fella. We're the young girl who's saying, well, that never happened here. Us not seeing the mighty acts of God, us not seeing the mighty deeds of renown before we arrive, do not make them untrue. Doesn't mean they didn't happen. I've told this story here before, and I love it so much because it's one of those stories that kind of burns your In your memory, we were staying at the Meteor Crater in Arizona. You ever been there? It's this giant crater. It's a mile wide where long, long time ago, something giant hit the earth. Big giant meteor made this mile wide hole. We're standing there taking pictures. You know, we're being all tourists and stuff like that. And this group from New England, and you can tell from the way they're talking and dressed and all that, got there. Mom and dad are taking their time getting cameras or whatever. This eight-year-old kid comes running down. He stands beside me. You know, at the observatory there, he's like, dad, dad, Eastern accent, which I can't do. But he says, dad, dad, get down here. He says, you got to see this, which, of course, his dad had driven there. So he knew there was something down. He says, dad, you got to see this. Something really big happened here. Something really big happened here. That's why we thank God for yesterday, because something really big happened here. We weren't here for it. But something big happened here where God created the world, decided to sustain it from now until its, its work is complete. And if it goes sour, and it did, he desired and promised to redeem it. Something big has happened right here. So thank God for yesterday. Thank God for yesterday. It says in Psalm 66, 5 and 6, Come and see what God has done. His awesome deeds for mankind. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the waters on foot. Come, let us rejoice in Him. We have a heritage that says something big has happened. And our excitement is that we get to know about it. See, God permits us access to the faith. The blemished and broken that came before us, and, and, and we get to see the reconciliation of their souls that gives us hope. See, we're not the first ones on the road of imperfectness. When you read the biblical story, there's a whole bunch of them. You can see how, how, how there's a number of women and men, and I could spend a lot of time, but time doesn't permit me to go through all their story. But you think of the woman who, who, who's crying so much, she uses her tears to wash Jesus' feet. You think of, of Paul, who called himself the chieftain among all sinners. The biblical story is filled with imperfect people. There's a lot of biblical imperfectness, and that is in there to show us that we can come before God in hope. And what an opportunity that God permits us access to the faith and the blameless that precede us inspire us towards our possibilities. Don't you all have some role model of faith that you look to and you think, man, their faith was awesome. I wish I could have an awesome faith like that. It gives us something to aim our lives at. I know I do. I hope you do as well. Every Christian can thank God for the great events that have brought us hope for this life and for eternity. For the people that wrote it down and all the things that that came to here, to this moment. We did not get here without a yesterday. So give thanks to God for that. And thank the Lord for today. Again, Psalm 63 says, Say to God, how awesome of your, are your deeds. Further in Psalm 66, it says, Praise our God for all peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He has preserved our lives and kept our feet from slipping. God is preserving us in a world where fidelity to him is difficult. I want to tell you this, Christians, because we sometimes mistake this. There were never any good old days. In Christianity, there were never any good old days for Christians. 
Christians have always struggled with the conditions of the world around them. And through it all, they believe that God was alive and preserving them for himself. I have a hymn that we sing from time to time at this service. I love I didn't write it. It's much older than Pastor Mike. But let me just give you a little bit of the first stanza. The first stanza says this. You'll know it. When peace like a river. You know where I'm going with this? When peace like a river attendeth my way. That means when everything's great, when everything's great, when sorrows like sea billows roll, that means when sorrows are coming along, it's like the, like the waves of the sea. They don't ever stop. You ever been on a seashore? It never stops day or night. It might recede a little bit, but the, the sea never stops billowing. Whatever my lot, you know this, right? Whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say. It is well, it is well with my soul. <clears throat> Whether it's good or bad, the circumstances of our life, we're taught to sing, it is well with my soul. You see, there were never any good old days for Christians, and we're not living any right now, but that means that there's a tremendous opportunity in front of us today. There's tremendous opportunities in front of us right now. Spiritual bankruptcy is, is just uh, rampant in our, in our city, in our country, our county, in our state, in our, in our world. The confusion over what is moral and righteous is, is also rampant. Minds are broken. Hearts are broken. And here's the thing. That leads the Christian church an opportunity because God brings out the best of us under pressure and in tough times. See, the world's connected. We can communicate across the world right now. This is no time for lackadaisical Christianity. There's no time for weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's no time for us in worship to say, oh, the world's falling apart around us. Like, no, duh. There was never a good old days in Christianity. Because if you think they are, you're not reading the New Testament story right. The world's always turbulent. It's always broken when sea billows are rolling all the time. And in the midst of all that, we say it is well with our soul. And we worship and thank Him. Get this. For allowing us to be alive at such a time like this. The only moment we get to live in is this one. We need to give thanks for God to, for the real opportunity. Because there are so many people. You know, Tim Keller says, we're not living in a post-Christian age. We're living in a post-secular age. Which means, people have realized that rational, that, that, that Christianity is rational. That, 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 that there are things in the world we need. And one of the things that we need is spirituality. So even though we're living in a post-Christian, post-secular era, people are hungry for spirituality. What an opportunity. Guess what we have? That. We have the antidote to the illness that people have. We have the antidote, which means we have a responsibility and opportunity as Christians to share as we worship. We can share and go renewed to share that with others. Because we have a real opportunity to guide others to salvation and offer change for the world. And lastly, in your lifestyle of worship, thank the Lord for tomorrow. Psalm 66 says, everything on earth will worship you. They will sing your praises, shout in your name in glorious songs. And it goes on to say, for his, by his great power, he rules forever. A great thing is coming. A great thing is coming, friends. The end of the story is known. It's there in the pages of the Bible. It tells us what's going on. It says that God, God's promises will be fulfilled and his purposes completed. I don't know all the de- details, neither the gospel writers, and you don't have to. What we need to do is have confidence. We have to have confidence that God is in control. That is the Christian faith. Confidence that God is in control. Because complete confidence in God allows us to completely and fully be in worship, not simply at it. I invite you, not just in these moments, to be in worship frequently and in many moments outside of here so that you can be God's hope for the world of this time. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, I pray these things upon you. Amen.